Chapter 17. We Shop for Waterbeds It was Annabeth's idea. She loaded us into the back of a Vegas taxi as if we actually had money and told the driver, Los Angeles, please. The cabbie chewed a cigar and sized us up. That's 300 miles. For that, you gotta pay up front. You accept casino debit cards? Annabeth asked. He shrugged. Some of them. Same as credit cards. I gotta swipe them through first. Annabeth handed him her green Lotus Cash card. He looked at it skeptically. Swipe it, Annabeth invited. He did. His meter machine started rattling. The lights flashed. Finally, an infinity symbol came up next to the dollar sign. The cigar fell out of the driver's mouth. He looked back at us, his eyes wide. Where to in Los Angeles, uh, your highness? The Santa Monica Pier? Annabeth sat up a little straighter. I could tell that she liked the your highness thing. Get us there fast and you can keep the change. Maybe she shouldn't have told him that. The cab speedometer never dipped below 95 the whole way through the Mojave Desert. On the road, we had plenty of time to talk. I told Annabeth and Grover about my latest dream, but the details got sketchier the more time the more I tried to remember them. The Lotus Casino seemed to have short-circuited my memory. I couldn't recall what the invisible servant's voice had sounded like, though, though I was sure it was somebody I knew. The servant had called the monster in the pit something other than my lord, some special name or title. The silent one? Annabeth suggested. The rich one? Both of those are nicknames for Hades. Maybe, I said, though neither sounded quite right. That throne room sounds like Hades is, Grover said. That's the way it's usually described. I shook my head. Something's wrong. The throne room wasn't the main part of the dream. And that voice from the pit? I don't know. It just didn't feel like a god's voice. Annabeth's eyes widened. What? I asked. Oh, nothing. I was just... No, it has to be Hades. Maybe he sent this thief, this invisible person, to get the master bolt, and something went wrong. Like what? I... I don't know, she said. But if he stole Zeus's symbol of power from Olympus and the gods were hunting him? I mean, a lot of things could go wrong. So this thief had to hide the bolt, or he lost it somehow. Anyway, he failed to bring it to Hades. That's what the voice in your dream is, right? The guy failed. That would explain the Furies, what their Furies were searching for when they came after us on the bus. Maybe they thought we'd retrieved the bolt. I wasn't sure what was wrong with her. She looked pale. But if I'd already retrieved the bolt, I said, why would I be traveling to the underworld? To threaten Hades, Grover suggested. To bribe or blackmail him into getting your mom back. I whistled. You have evil thoughts for a goat. Why, thank you. But the thing in the pit said it was waiting for two items, I said. If the master bolt is one, what's the other? Grover shook his head, clearly mystified. Annabeth was looking at me as if she knew my next question and was silently willing me not to ask it. You have an idea what might be in that pit, don't you? He asked her. I mean, if it isn't Hades? Percy, let's not talk about it, because if it isn't Hades... No, it has to be Hades. Wasteland rolled by. We passed a sign that said, California State Line, 12 miles. I got the feeling I was missing one simple, critical piece of information. It was like when I stared at a common word I should know, but I couldn't make sense of it because one or two letters were floating around. The more I thought about my quest, the more I was sure that confronting Hades wasn't the real answer. There was something else going on, something even more dangerous. The problem was we were hurtling toward the underworld at 95 miles an hour, betting that Hades had the master bolt. If we got there and found out we were wrong, we wouldn't have time to correct ourselves. The solstice deadline would pass and war would begin. The answer is in the underworld, Annabeth assured me. You saw the spirits of the dead, Percy. There's only one place that could be. We're doing the right thing. She tried to boost our morale by suggesting clever strategies for getting into the land of the dead, but my heart wasn't in it. There were just too many unknown factors. It was like cramming for a test without knowing the subject. And believe me, I'd done that enough times. The cab sped west. Every gust of wind through Death Valley sounded like a spirit of the dead. Every time the brakes hissed on an 18-wheeler, it reminded me of Akedna's reptilian voice. At sunset, 
the taxi dropped us at the beach at Santa Monica. It looked exactly the way L.A. beaches do in the movies, only it smelled worse. There were carnival rides lining the pier, palm trees lining the sidewalks, homeless guys sleeping in the sand dunes, and surfer dudes waiting for the next perfect wave. Annabeth Grover and I walked down to the edge of the surf. What now? Annabeth asked. The Pacific was turning gold in the setting sun. I thought about how long it had been since I'd stood on the beach at Montauk, on the opposite side of the country, looking out at a different sea. How could there be a god who could control all that? What did my science teacher used to say? Two-thirds of the Earth's surface was covered in water? How could I be the son of someone that powerful? I stepped into the surf. Percy, Annabeth said, what are you doing? I kept walking, up to my waist, then my chest. She called after me. You know how polluted that water is? There's all kinds of toxic. That's when my head went on her. I held my, I held my breath at first. It's difficult to intentionally inhale water. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I gasped. Sure enough, I could breathe normally. I walked down into the shoals. I shouldn't have been able to see through the murk, but somehow I could tell where everything was. I could sense the rolling texture of the bottom. I could make out sand dollar colonies dotting the sandbars. I could even see the currents, warm and cold, streams swirling together. I felt something rub against my leg. I looked down and almost shot out of the water like a ballistic missile. Sliding along beside me was a five-foot-long mako shark. But the thing wasn't attacking. It was muzzling me, healing like a dog. Tentatively, I touched its dorsal fin. It bucked a little, as if inviting me to hold tighter. I grabbed the fin with both hands. It took off, pulling me along. The shark carried me down into the darkness. It deposited me at the edge of the ocean proper, where the sandbank dropped off into a huge chasm. It was like standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon at midnight, not being able to see much, but knowing the void was right there. The surface shimmered, maybe 150 feet above. I knew I should have been crushed by the pressure, but again, I shouldn't have been able to breathe. I wondered if there was a limit to how deep I could go, if I could sink straight to the bottom of the Pacific. Then I saw something glimmering in the darkness below, growing bigger and brighter as it rose toward me. A woman's voice, like my mother's, called Percy Jackson. As she got closer, her shape became clear. She had a flowing black hair, a dress made of green silk, light flickered around her, and her eyes were so distractingly beautiful, I hardly noticed the stallion-sized seahorse she was riding. She dismounted. The seahorse and the mako shark whisked off and started playing something that looked like tag, the underwater lady smiled at me. You've come far, Percy Jackson. Well done. I wasn't quite sure what to do, so I bowed. You're the woman who spoke to me in the Mississippi River. Yes, child. I am a Nereid, a spirit of the sea. It was not easy to appear so far upriver, but the Nyads, my freshwater cousins, helped sustain my life force. They honor Lord Poseidon, though they do not serve in his court. And you serve in Poseidon's court? She nodded. It has been many years since a child of the sea god has been born. We have watched you with great interest. Suddenly, I remembered faces in the waves off Montauk Beach when I was a little boy, reflections of smiling women. Like so many of the weird things in my life, I'd never given it much thought before. If my father's so interested in me, I said, why isn't he here? Why doesn't he speak to me? A cold current rose out of the depths. Do not judge the lord of the sea too harshly, the Nereid told me. He stands at the brink of an unwanted war. He has much to occupy his time. Besides, he is forbidden to help you directly. The gods may not show such favoritism. Even to their own children? Especially to them. The gods can work by indirect influence only. That is why... I give you a warning and a gift. She held out her hand. Three white pearls flash in her palm. I know you journeyed to Hades' realm, she said. Few mortals have ever done this and survived. Orpheus, who had great music skill. Hercules, who had great strength. Houdini, who could escape even the depths of Tartarus. Do you have these talents? 
Um, no, ma'am. Ah, but you have something else, Percy. You have gifts you have only begun to know. The oracles have foretold of great and terrible future for you, should you survive to manhood. Poseidon should have, should not, would not have you die before your time. Therefore, take these, and when you are in need, smash a pearl at your feet. What will happen? That, she said, depends on the need. But remember, what belongs to the sea will always return to the sea. What about the warning? Her eyes flickered with green light. Go with what your heart tells you, or you will lose all. Hades feeds on doubt and hopelessness. He will trick you if he can, make you mistrust your own judgment. Once you are in his realm, he will never willingly let you leave. Keep faith. Good luck, Percy Jackson. She summoned her seahorse and rode toward the vo void. Wade, I called. At the river. You said not to trust the gifts. What gifts? Goodbye, young hero, she called back her voice fading into the depths. You must listen to your heart. She became a speck of glowing green, and then she was gone. I wanted to follow her down into the darkness. I wanted to see the court of Poseidon, but I looked up at the sunset darkening on the surface. My friends were waiting. We had so little time. I kicked upward toward the shore. When I reached the beach, my clothes dried instantly. I told Grover and Annabeth what had happened and showed them the pearls. Annabeth grimaced. No gift comes without a price. They were, they were free. No, she shook her head. There is no such thing as a free lunch. That's an ancient Greek saying that's translated pretty well into American. There will be a price. You wait. On that happy thought, we turned our backs on the sea. With some spare change from Aries' backpack, we took the bus into West Hollywood. I showed the driver the Underwood, uh, Underworld address slip I'd taken from Auntie M's Garden Gnome Emporium, but he never heard of DOA Recording Studios. You remind me of somebody I saw on TV, he told me. You a child actor or something? Um, I'm a, I'm a stunt double for a lot of child actors. Oh, that explains it. We thanked him and got off quickly at the next stop. We wandered for miles on foot, looking for DOA. Nobody seemed to know where it was. It didn't appear in the phone book. Twice, we ducked into alleys to avoid cop cars. I froze in front of an appliance door window because a television was playing an interview with somebody who looked very familiar. My stepdad, Smelly Gabe. He was talking to Barbara Walters. I mean, as if he were some kind of huge celebrity. She was interviewing him in our apartment in the middle of a poker game, and there was a young blonde lady sitting next to him patting his head. A fake tear glistened on his cheek. He was saying, Honest, Ms. Walters, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for sugar here, my grief counselor, I'd be a wreck. My stepson took everything I cared about. My wife? My Camaro? I, I'm sorry. I have trouble talking about it. There you have it, America. Barbara Walters turned to the camera. A man torn apart. An adolescent boy with serious issues. Let me show you again the last known photo of this troubled young fugitive taken a week ago in Denver. The screen cut to a grainy shot of me, Annabeth, and Grover standing outside the Colorado diner talking to Aries. Who are the other children in this photo? Barbara Walters asked dramatically. Who is the man with them? Is Percy Jackson a delinquent, a terrorist, or perhaps a brainwashed victim of a frightening new cult? When we come back, we chat with a leading child psychologist. Stay tuned, America. Come on, Grover told me. He hauled me away before I could punch a hole in the appliance store window. It got dark, and hungry-looking characters started coming out on the streets to play. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a New Yorker. I don't scare easy. But L.A. had a totally different feel from New York. Back home, everything seemed close. Didn't matter how big the city was. You could get anywhere without getting lost. The street pattern and the subway made sense. There was a system to how things worked. A kid could be safe as long as he wasn't stupid. L.A. wasn't like that. It was spread out, chaotic, hard to move around. It reminded me of Aries. 
It wasn't enough for LA to be big and had to prove it was prove it was big by being loud and strange and difficult to navigate too. I didn't know how we were ever going to find the entrance to the underworld by tomorrow, the summer solstice. We walked past gangbangers, bums, and street hawkers who looked at us like they were trying to figure out if we were worth the trouble of mugging. As we hurried past the entrance of an alley, a voice from the darkness said, Hey, you! Like an idiot, I stopped. Before I knew it, we were surrounded. A gang of kids had circled us. Six of them. Uh, six, of, six of them in all. White kids with expensive clothes and mean faces. Like the kids at Yancey Academy. Rich brats playing at being bad boys. Instinctively, I uncapped Riptide. When the sword appeared out of nowhere, the kids backed off, but their leader was either really stupid or really brave because he kept coming at me with a switchblade. I made the mistake of swinging. The kid yelped, but he must have been 100% mortal because the blade passed harmlessly right through his chest. He looked down. What the? I figured I had about three seconds before his shock turned to anger. Run! I screamed at Annabeth and Grover. We pushed two kids out of the way and raced down the street, not knowing where we were going. We turned a sh sharp corner. There! Annabeth shouted. Only one store on the block looked open, its windows glaring with neon. The sign above the door said something like, Krusty's Water Reed Palace. Krusty's Waterbed Palace? Grover translated. Didn't sound like a place I'd ever go, except in an emergency, but this definitely qualified. We burst through the doors, ran behind a waterbed, and ducked. A split second later, the gang kids ran past outside. I think we lost them, Grover panted. A voice behind us boomed. Lost too! We all jumped. Standing behind us was a guy who looked like a raptor in a leisure suit. He was at least seven feet tall, with absolutely no hair. He had gray, leathery skin, thick-lidded eyes, and a cold, reptilian smile. He moved toward us slowly, but I got the feeling he'd, he could move fast if he wanted to. His suit might have come from the Lotus Casino. It belonged back in the 70s, big time. The shirt was silk paisley, unbuttoned halfway down his hairless chest. The lapels on his velvet jacket were as wide as landing strips. The silver chains around his neck. I couldn't even count them. I'm crusty, he said, with a tartar yellow smile. I resisted the urge to say, yes, you are. Uh, sorry to barge in, I told him. We were just, um, browsing. You mean, hiding from those no-good kids? He grumbled. They hang around every night. I get a lot of people in here thanks to them. Say, you want to look at a waterbed? I was about to say no thanks when he put a huge paw on my shoulder and steered me deeper into the showroom. There was every kind of waterbed you could imagine. Different kinds of wood, different patterns of sheets, Queen size, king size, emperor of the universe size. This is my most popular model, Krusty spread his hands out proudly over a bed covered with black satin sheets with built-in lava lamps on the headboard. The mattress vibrated so it looked like oil-flavored jello. Million hand massage, Krusty told us. Go on, try it out. Shoot, take a nap, I don't care. No business today anyway. Um, I said, I don't think... Million hand massage, Grover cried and dove in. Oh, you guys, this is cool. Hmm, Krusty said, stroking his leathery chin. Almost, almost. Almost what, I asked. He looked at Annabeth. Do me a favor and try this one over here, honey. Might fit. Annabeth said, but what? He patted her reassuringly on the shoulder and led her over to the Safari Deluxe model with teakwood lines carved into the frame and a leopard-patterned comforter. When Annabeth didn't want to lie down, Krusty pushed her. Hey, she protested. Krusty snapped his fingers. Ergo! Ropes sprang from the sides of the bed, lashing around Annabeth, holding her to the mattress. Grover tried to get up, but ropes sprang from his black satin bed too and lashed him down. Not cool, he yelled, his voice vibrating from the million hand massage. N -n -n Not cool at all. The giant looked at Annabeth, then turned toward me and grinned. Almost, darn it. I tried to step away, but his hand shot out and clamped around the back of my neck. Whoa, kid, don't worry. 
We'll find you one in a sec. Let my friends go. Oh, sure I will. But I gotta make them fit first. What do you mean? All the beds are exactly six feet, see? Your friends are too short. Gotta make them fit. Annabeth and Grover kept struggling. Can't stand imperfect measurements, Krusty muttered. Ergo! A new set of ropes leaped out from the top and bottom of the beds, wrapping around Grover and Annabeth's ankles, then around their armpits. The rope started tightening, pulling my friends from both ends. Don't worry, Krusty told me. These are stretching jobs. Maybe three extra inches on their spines. They might even live. Now, why don't we find a bed you like, huh? Percy, Grover yelled. My mind was racing. I knew I couldn't take on this giant waterbed salesman alone. He would snap my neck before I ever got my sword out. Your real name's not Krusty, is it? I asked. Legally, it's Procrustes, he admitted. The stretcher, I said. I remember the story. The giant who tried to kill Theseus with excess hospitality on his way to Athens. Yeah, the salesman said. But who can pronounce Procrustes? Bad for business. Now, Krusty, anybody can say that. You're right. It's got a good ring to it. His eyes lit up. You think so? Oh, absolutely, I said. And the workmanship on these beds? Fabulous. He grinned hugely, but his fingers didn't loosen on my neck. I tell my customers that every time. Nobody bothers to look at the workmanship. How many built-in lava lamp headboards have you seen? Not too many. That's right. Percy, Annabeth yelled. What are you doing? Don't mind her, I told Procrustes. She's impossible. The giant laughed. All my customers are. Never six feet exactly. So inconsiderate. And then they complained about the fitting. What do you do if they're longer than six feet? Oh, that happens all the time. It's a simple fix. He let go of my neck, but before I could react, he reached behind a nearby sales desk and brought out a huge double-bladed brass axe. He said, I just center the subject as best I can and lop off whatever hangs over on either end. Ah, I said, swallowing hard. Sensible. I'm so glad to come across an intelligent customer. The ropes were really stretching my friends now. Annabeth was turning pale. Grover made gurgling sounds like a strangled goose. So, Krusty, I said, trying to keep my voice light. I glanced at the sales tag on the Valentine-shaped honeymoon special. Does this one really have dynamic stabilizers to stop wave motion? Absolutely. Try it out. Yeah, maybe I will, but... Would it work even for a big guy like you? No waves at all? Guaranteed. No way. Way. Show me. He sat down eagerly on the bed, patted the mattress. No waves, see? I snapped my fingers. Ergo. Ropes lashed around Krusty and flattened him against the mattress. Hey, he yelled. Center him just right, I said. The ropes readjusted themselves at my command. Krusty's whole head stuck out the top. His feet stuck out the bottom. No, he said. Wait, this is just a demo. I uncapped Riptide. A few simple adjustments. I had no qualms about what I was about to do. If Krusty were human, I couldn't hurt him anyway. If he was a monster, he deserved to be turned into dust for a while. You drive a hard bargain, he told me. I'll give you 30% off on selected floor models. I think I'll start with the top. I raised my sword. No money down. No interest, interest for six months. I swung my, the sword. Krusty stopped making offers. I cut the ropes on the other beds. Annabeth and Grover got to their feet, groaning and wincing and cursing me a lot. You look taller, I said. Very funny, Annabeth said. Be faster next time. I looked at the bulletin board behind Krusty's sales desk. There was an advertisement for Hermes Delivery Service and another for the all-new Compendium of L.A. Area Monsters, the only monstrous yellow pages you'll ever need. Under that, a bright orange flyer for DOA Recording Studios, offering commissions for heroes' souls. We are always looking for new talent. DOA's address was right underneath with the map. Come on, I told my friends. 
Give us a minute, Grover complained. We were almost stretched to death. And you're ready for the underworld, I said. It's only a block from here. Chapter 18. Annabeth Does Obedient School We stood in the shadows of Valencia Boulevard, looking up at the gold letters etched in black marble. DOA Recording Studios. Underneath, stenciled on the glass door, no solicitors, no loitering, no living. It was almost midnight, but the lobby was brightly lit and full of people. Behind the security desk sat a tough-looking guard with sunglasses and an earpiece. I turned to my friends. Okay, you remember the plan. The plan, Grover gulped. Yeah, I love the plan, Annabeth said. What happens if the plan doesn't work? Don't think negative. Right, she said. We're entering the land of the dead, and I shouldn't think negative. I took the pearls out of my pocket, the three milky spheres the Nereid had given me in Santa Monica. They didn't seem like much of a backup in case something went wrong. Annabeth put her hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Percy. You're right. We'll make it. It'll be fine. She gave Grover a nudge. Oh, right, he chimed in. We got this far. We'll find the master bolt and save your mom. No problem. I looked at them both and felt really grateful. Only a few minutes before, I'd almost gotten them stretched to death on deluxe, deluxe waterbeds, and now they're trying to be brave for my sake, trying to make me feel better. I slipped the pearls back in my pocket. Let's whoop some underworld butt. We walked inside the DOA lobby. Muzak played softly on hidden speakers. The carpet and walls were steel gray. Pencil cactuses grew in the corners like skeleton hands. The furniture was black leather, and every seat was taken. There were people sitting on couches, people standing up, people staring in the windows or waiting for the elevator. Nobody moved or talked or did much of anything. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see them all just fine, but if I focused on any one of them in particular, they started looking transparent. I could see right through their bodies. The security guard's desk was a raised platform, so we had to look up at him. He was tall and elegant, with chocolate-colored skin and bleached blonde hair shaved military style. He wore tortoiseshell sa- shades and a silk Indian suit that matched his hair. A black, ta- black rose was pinned to his lapel under a silver name tag. I read the name tag, then looked at him in bewilderment. Your name's Chiron? He leaned across the desk. I couldn't say anything, see anything in his glasses except my own reflection, but his smile was sweet and cold like a python's right before it eats you. What a precious young lad. He had a strange accent, British, maybe, but also as if he had learned English as a second language. Tell me, mate, do I look like a sendor? No. Sir, he added smoothly. Sir, I said. He pinched the name tag and ran his finger under the letters. Can you read this, mate? It says, C-H-A-R-O-N. Say it with me, Karen. Karen. Amazing. Now, Mr. Karen. Mr. Karen, I said. Well done. He sat back. I hate being confused with that old horseman. And now, how may I help you, little dead ones? His question caught in my stomach like a fastball. I looked at Annabeth for support. We want to go to the underworld, she said. Karen's mouth twitched. Well, that's refreshing. It is? she asked. Straightforward and honest. No screaming, no, there must be a mistake, Mr. Karen. He looked us over. How did you die, then? I nudged Grover. Oh, he said, um, drowned in the bathtub. All three of you? Karen asked. We nodded. Big bathtub? Karen looked mildly impressed. I don't suppose you have coins for passage. Normally, with adults, you see, I could charge your American Express or add the ferry price to your last cable bill. But with children, alas, you never die prepared. Suppose you'll have to take a seat for a few centuries. Oh, but we have coins! I set three golden drachmas on the counter, part of the stash I'd found in Krusty's office desk. Well now, Karen moistened his lips. Real drachmas? Real golden drachmas? I haven't seen those in... 
His fingers hovered greedily over the coins. We were so close. Then Karen looked at me. That cold stare behind his glasses seemed to bore a hole through my chest. Here now, he said. You couldn't read my name correctly. Are you dyslexic, lad? No, I said. I'm dead. Karen leaned forward and took a sniff. You're not dead. I should have known. You're a godling. We have to get to the underworld, I insisted. Karen made a growling sound deep in his throat. Immediately, all the people in the waiting room got up and started pacing, agitated, lighting cigarettes, running hands through their hair, or checking their wristwatches. Leave while you can, Karen told us. I'll just take these and forget I saw you. He started to go for the coins, but I snatched them back. No service, no tip. I tried to sound, tried to sound braver than I felt. Karen growled again, a deep, blood-chilling sound. The spirits of the dead started pounding on the elevator doors. It's a shame, too. We had more to offer. I held up the entire bag from Krusty's stash. I uh, took out a fistful of drachmas and let the coins spill through my fingers. Karen's growl changed into something more like a lion's purr. Do you think I can be bought, godling? Huh. Just out of curiosity, uh, how much have you got there? A lot, I said. I bet Hades doesn't pay you well enough for such hard work. Oh, you don't know the half of it. How would you like to babysit these spirits all day? Always, please don't let me be dead, be dead or please let me get across for free. I haven't had a pay raise in 3,000 years. Do you imagine suits like this come cheap? You deserve better, I agreed. Little appreciation. Respect, good pay. With each word, I stacked another gold coin on the counter. Karen glanced down at his silk Italian jacket, as if imagining himself in something even better. I must say, lad, you're making some sense now. Just a little. I stacked another few coins. I could mention a pay raise while I'm talking to Hades, he sighed. The boat's almost full anyway. I might as well add you three and be off. He stood, scooped up our money, and said, Come along. We pushed through the crowd of waiting spirits, who started grabbing at our clothes like the wind, their voices whispering things I couldn't make out. Karen shoved them out of the way, grumbling, Freeloaders. He escorted us into the elevator, which was already crowded with souls of the dead, each one holding a green boarding pass. Karen grabbed two spirits who were trying to get get on with us and pushed them back into the lobby. Right. Now, no one get any ideas while I'm gone, he announced to the waiting room. And if anyone moves the dial off my easy listening station again, I'll make sure you're here another thousand years, understand? He shut the doors. He put a key card into the slot on the elevator panel, and we started to descend. What happens to the spirits waiting in the lobby? Annabeth asked. Nothing. Karen asked. For how long? Forever, or until I'm feeling generous. Oh, she said. That's fair. Karen raised an eyebrow. Whoever said death was fair, young miss? Wait until it's your turn. You'll die soon enough where you're going. We'll get out alive, I said. Huh. I got a sudden dizzy feeling. We weren't going down anymore, but forward. The air turned misty. Spirits around me started changing shape. Their modern clothes flickered, turning into gray hooded robes. The floor of the elevator began swaying. I blinked hard. When I opened my eyes, Karen's creamy Italian suited and replaced by a long black robe. His tortoise shell glasses were gone, where his eyes should have been were empty sockets, like Aerie's eyes, except Karen's were totally dark, full of night and death and despair. He saw me looking and said, well, nothing, I managed. I thought he was grinning, but that wasn't it. The flesh on his face was becoming transparent, letting me see straight through to his skull. The floor kept swaying. Grover said, I think I'm getting seasick. When I blinked again, the elevator wasn't an elevator anymore. We were standing in a wooden barge. Karen was pulling us across a dark, oily river, swirling with bones, dead fish, 
and other stranger things. Plastic dolls, crushed carnations, soggy diplomas with gilt edges. The river sticks, Annabeth murmured. It's so polluted, Karen said. For thousands of years, you humans have been throwing in everything as you come across. Hopes, dreams, wishes that never came true. Irresponsible waste management, if you ask me. Mist curled off the filthy river. Above us, almost lost in the gloom, was a ceiling of stalactites. Ahead, the far shore glimmered with greenish light, the color of poison. Panic closed up in my throat. What was I doing here? These people around me, they were dead. Annabeth grabbed hold of my hand. Under normal circumstances, this would have embarrassed me, but I understood how she felt. She wanted reassurance that somebody else was alive on this boat. I found myself muttering a prayer, though I wasn't quite sure who I was praying to. Down here, only one god mattered, and he was the one I had come to confront. The shoreline of the underworld came into view. Craggy rocks and volcanic, black volcanic sand stretched inland about a hundred yards to the base of a high stone wall, while, uh, which marched off in either direction as far as we could see. A sound came from somewhere nearby in the green gloom echoing off the stones, a howl of a large animal. Old Three-Face is hungry, Karen said. His smile turned skeletal in the greenish light. Bad luck for you, godlings. The bottom of our boat slid onto the black sand. The dead began to disembark. A woman holding a little girl's hand. An old man and an old woman hobbling along arm in arm. A boy, no older than I was, shuffling silently along in his gray robe. Karen said, I'd wish you luck, mate, but there isn't any down here. Mind you, don't forget to mention my pay raise. He counted our golden coins in his pouch, then took up his pole. He warbled something that sounded like a Barry Manilow song as he ferried the empty barge back across the river. We follow the spirits up a well-worn path. I'm not exactly sure what I was expecting, pearly gates or a big black portcullis or something, but the entrance to the underworld looked like a cross between airport security and the Jersey Turnpike. There were three separate entrances under one huge black archway that said, You are now entering... Erebus. Each entrance had a pass-through metal detector with security cameras mounted on top. Beyond this were toll booths manned by black-robed ghouls like Karen. The howling of the hungry animal was really loud now, but I couldn't see where it was coming from. The three-headed dog, Cerberus, who was supposed to guard Hades' door, was nowhere to be seen. The dead queued up in three lines. Two marked attendant on duty, and one marked easy death. The easy death line was moving right along. The other two were crawling. What do you figure? I asked Annabeth. The fast line must go straight to Asphodel Fields, she said. No contest. They don't want to risk judgment from the court because it might go against them. There's a court for dead people? Yeah, three judges. They switch around who sits on the bench. King Minos, Thomas Jefferson, Shakespeare, people like that. Sometimes they look at the life and decide that person needs a special reward, the fields of Elysium. Sometimes they decide on punishment. But most people, well, they just lived. Nothing special, good or bad. So they go to the Asphodel fields. And do what? Grover said. Imagine standing in a wheat field in Kansas forever. Harsh, I said. Not as harsh as that, Grover muttered. Look. A couple of black-robed ghouls had pulled aside one spirit and were frisking him at the security desk. The face of the dead man looked vaguely familiar. He's that preacher who made the news, remember? Grover asked. Oh, yeah, I did remember now. We'd seen him on TV a couple of times at the Yancey Academy dorm. He was that annoying televangelist from upstate New York who'd raised millions of dollars for orphanages and then got caught spending the money on stuff for his mansion like gold-plated toilet seats and an indoor putt-putt golf course. He died in a police chase when his Lamborghini, for the Lord, went off a cliff. I said, what are they doing to him? Special punishment from Hades, Grover guessed. The really bad people uh, get his personal atten attention as soon as they arrive. The, fur 
the kindly ones, will set up an eternal torture for him. The thought of the Furies made me shudder. I realized I was in their home territory now. Old Mrs. Dodds would be licking her lips with anticipation. But if he's a preacher, I said, and he believes in a different hell, Grover shrugged. Who says he's seeing this place the way we're seeing it? Humans see what they want to see. You're very stubborn or persistent that way. We got closer to the gates. The howling was so loud that now that it shook the ground at my feet, but I still couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Then, about fifty feet in front of us, the green mist shimmered. Standing just where the path split into three lanes was an enormous, shadowy monster. I hadn't seen it before because it was half-transparent, like the dead. Until it moved, it blended with whatever was behind it. Only its eyes and teeth looked solid, and it was staring straight at me. My jaw hung open. All I could think to say was, He's a Rottweiler. I always imagined Cerberus as a big black mastiff, but he was obviously a purebred Rottweiler, except, of course, that he was twice the size of a woolly mammoth, mostly invisible, and had three heads. The dead walked right up to him, no fear at all. The attendant on duty lines parted on either side of him. The easy death spirits walked right between his front paws and under his belly, which they could do without even crouching. I'm starting to see him better, I murmured. Why is that? I think... Annabeth moistened her lips. I'm afraid it's because we're getting closer to being dead. The dog's middle head craned toward us. It sniffed the air and growled. It can smell the living, I said. But that's okay, Grover said, trembling next to me, because we have a plan. Right, Annabeth said. I'd never heard her voice sound quite so small. A plan. We moved toward the monster. The middle head snarled at us, then barked so loud my eyeballs rattled. Can you understand it? I asked Grover. Oh yeah, he said. I can understand it. What's it saying? I don't think humans have a four-letter word that translates exactly. I took the big stick out of my backpack, a bedpost I'd broken off Krusty's Safari Deluxe floor model. I held it up, and I tried to channel my happy dog thoughts toward Cerberus, Apollo commercials, Oh, Alpo commercials, cute little puppies, fire hydrants. I tried to smile like I wasn't about to die. Hey, big fella, I called up. I bet they don't play with you much. Growl. Good boy, I said weakly. I waved the stick. The dog's middle head followed the movement. The other two heads trained their eyes on me, completely ignoring the spirits. I had Cerberus's undivided attention. I wasn't sure that was a good thing. Fetch. I threw the stick into the gloom, a good solid, solid throw. I heard it go kersplash in the river sticks. Cerberus glared at me, unimpressed. His eyes were baleful and cold. So much for the plan. Cerberus was now making a new kind of growl, deeper down in his three throats. Um, Grover said. Percy? Yeah. I just thought you'd want to know. Yeah. Cerberus? He's saying we've got ten seconds to pray to the god of our choice. After that, well, he's hungry. Wait, Annabeth said. She started rifling through her pack. Uh-oh, I thought. Five seconds, Grover said. Do we run now? Annabeth produced a red rubber ball the size of a grapefruit. It was labeled Waterland, Denver, Waterland, Denver, Colorado. Before I could stop her, she raised the ball and marched straight up to Cerberus. She shouted, See the ball? Want the ball, Cerberus? Sit. Cerberus looked as stunned as we were. All three of his heads cocked sideways. Six nostrils dilated. Sit, Annabeth called again. I was sure that at any moment she would become the world's largest milk-bone dog biscuit. But instead, Cerberus licked his three sets of lips, shifted on his haunches, and sat immediately crushing a dozen spirits who'd been passing underneath him in the easy death line. The spirits made muffled hisses as they dissipated, like the air let out of tires. Annabeth said, Good boy. She threw Cerberus the ball. He caught it in his middle mouth. It was barely big enough for him to chew, and the other head started snapping at the middle, trying to get the new toy. Drop it, Annabeth ordered. Cerberus' head stopped fighting and looked at her. The ball was wedged between two of the teeth like a tiny piece of gum. He made a loud, scary whimper, then dropped the ball, now slimy and bitten nearly in half, 
at Annabeth's feet. Good boy. She picked up the ball, ignoring the monster spit all over it. She turned toward us. Go, now. Easy, Deathline. It's faster. I said, but now, she ordered, in the same tone she was using on the dog. Grover and I inched forward warily. Cerberus started to growl. Stay, Annabeth ordered the monster. If you want the ball, stay. Cerberus whimpered, but he stayed where he was. What about you? I asked Annabeth as we passed her. I know what I'm doing, Percy, she murmured. At least, I'm pretty sure. Grover and I walked between the monster's legs. Please, Annabeth, I prayed. Don't let him tell him to sit again. We made it through. Cerberus wasn't any less scary looking from the, ba scary looking from the back. Annabeth said, Good dog. She held up the tattered red ball and probably came to the same conclusion I did. If she rewarded Cerberus, there'd be nothing left for another trick. She threw the ball anyway. Uh, the monster's left mouth immediately snatched it up, only to be attacked by the middle head, while the right head moaned in protest. While the monster was distracted, Annabeth walked brisk briskly under its belly and joined us at the metal detector. How did you do that? I asked, amazed. Obedient school, she said breathlessly, and I was surprised to see there were tears in her eyes. When I was little, in my dad's house, we had a Doberman. Never mind that, Grover said, tugging at my shirt. Come on! We were about to bolt through the easy death line when Cerberus moaned pitifully from all three mouths. Annabeth stopped. She turned to face the dog, who had done a 180 to look at us. Cerberus panted expectantly, the tiny red ball in pieces and a puddle of drool at its feet. Good boy, Annabeth said, but her voice sounded melancholy and uncertain. The monster's heads turned sideways as if worried about her. I'll bring you another ball soon, Annabeth promised. Would you like that? The monster whimpered. I didn't need to speak dog to know Cerberus was still waiting for the ball. Good dog. I'll come visit you soon. I, I promise. Annabeth turned to us. Let's go. Grover and I pushed through the metal detector, which immediately uh, screamed and set off flashing red lights. Unauthorized possessions. Magic detected. Cerberus started to bark. We burst through the easy death gate, which started even more alarms blaring, and raced into the underworld. A few minutes later, we were hiding, out of breath, in the rotten trunk of an immediate, immense black tree as security ghouls scur scuttled past, yelling for backup from the Furies. Grover murmured, Well, Percy, what have we learned today? That three-headed dogs prefer red rubber balls over sticks? No, Grover told me. We've learned that your plans really, really bite. I wasn't sure about that. I thought maybe Annabeth and I both had the right idea. Even from here in the underworld, everybody, even monsters, need a little attention once in a while. I thought about that as we waited for the ghouls to pass. I pretended not to see Annabeth swipe, wipe a tear from her cheek as she listened to the mournful keening of Cerberus in the distance, longing for his new friend.